what I would say to students now is tell me what you think is most interesting about something. Then that gives the task, I think, a bit more of a purpose. Hello, and welcome to the Arts of Language podcast with Andrew Poudois, founder of the Institute for Excellence in Writing, or as many like to say, IEW. My name is Julie Walker, and I'm honored to serve Andrew and IEW as the Director of Marketing. Our goal here is to equip teachers and teaching parents with methods and materials which will aid them in training their students to become confident and competent communicators and thinkers. Hi everyone, this week we're going to switch it up a bit and play for you the audio portion of one of our IEW webinars. Because the webinar itself is over an hour, we're splitting it into two parts, but we'll post both of them this week. And we'll post any links or websites mentioned in this recording at IEW.com slash podcast. Well, good evening. Andrew Pudua here at the IEW headquarters in eastern Oklahoma, where we had just a beautiful, warm, sunny, tranquil fall day. I was able to look out my window and see kids playing frisbee and one of those kind of moments of perfection that we, we love to have. This month, of course, as you know, we are on Unit 4. Tonight, we will be talking about Unit 4, and this would be in the new seminar workbook, the one on the right, pages 51 to 64. So if you want to pull that out, you'll see some of the same things. It is also always good for me to remind you that if you haven't got the upgrade to the new TWSS set, it is highly recommended. It is a tremendous improvement over the old one. And of course, it's more honest because in the old one, you see a much younger, thinner version of me. And in the new one, it's more like I actually look these days. And it's important also for me to remind you that this webinar is designed as a review and refinement for people who have already been through our course, either live or by video, so that you understand that that's our target. If you are completely new to teaching, writing, structure, and style, you're welcome to stay, but I don't want you to think that this is the primary presentation that we do. This is really a touch-up and refinement. Our real goal here, of course, is to kind of keep people moving and not getting stuck. The nine units, as you see them in the beginning of the seminar workbook, unit one and two, note making and outlines, writing from notes. Unit three, which we did last month in October, is retelling narrative stories. These are lots of different ways to use what we call the story sequence chart and hopefully you can review that if you need to. Tonight we are on unit four which is often called summarizing a reference or some people consider it short topic based reports. What I would say about unit four is a linchpin unit in that it is key to the units that come after. So some of the core ideas that we present to students in Unit 4 are essential for and utilized in Units 5, 6, 7, and 8. So we'll be doing that one tonight. In December, we will do a writing from pictures review. And often in December, we do a stylistic techniques review. In February, we'll get to Unit 6, summarizing multiple references. Unit 7, what used to be called creative, but is now called inventive writing. And then in April, Unit 8, and May, Unit 9. And what we recommend, especially I would say for those of you who are teaching students grade 4 and up, is that you shoot for moving through the nine units over 
the course of a school year. So this kind of one a month webinar is designed to help people not get stuck at a particular unit, but to have the confidence to have the questions answered to be able to then, when the calendar hits the new month, move on. If your students are younger, grade one, two, or three, you probably won't get through all nine units. You may spend six or maybe even eight weeks or two months per unit but that's okay because next year you can start and go through the units again and things will get faster and easier and the next year you work through again and everything gets easier and faster. Tonight, just so you know where we're going with Unit 4, we'll talk a little bit about the goals and recommended materials, talk about this word, summarize. We will talk about the whole very important idea of clinchers, the topic clincher rule, and then just the teaching procedure see a little resource for student samples. I'm going to go ahead and make an outline here with you tonight and hopefully it'll work that I can write it on an actual piece of paper just like I were using a whiteboard, scan it in and then have it posted up on the screen. So hopefully this will be very participatory for you. Talk a little bit about the stylistic techniques and how to stretch them out over time and of course time for questions. Goals for Unit 4 would be to simply find reading material which is at or below the reading level of a student and be able to take notes and write a summary and then to be able to create that keyword outline when you're taking notes choosing the facts that are interesting, important, or relevant. Also in Unit 4 we are going to introduce the idea of topic sentence and paragraph clincher. This topic sentence idea will give you outline purists a sigh of relief because now rather than having the Roman numeral just mean first thing coming at you, which is kind of what it does in units one, two, and three, now it will have the job of holding the topic sentence for the paragraph. And hopefully you can, in Unit 4, have students start to document their references and tell where they get information from. So those are some of the goals. What we recommend, of course, is a variety of, these will be fact-based material, non-fiction. And I would always stress the idea that those would be at or below the reading level of the students. And we don't want them to be too long but we have a lot of flexibility. This is so much easier than Unit 2 for you, the teacher, because a lot of times when you do Unit 1 and 2, you feel like, okay, I have to find a kind of the perfect source text with the perfect number of sentences that isn't too long and isn't too short, and you, you kind of shopping around, searching some people, writing their own. With Unit 4, it's much easier because you can use really like I said, anything that is at or below the student's reading level and you can then choose topics and then you choose facts for each topic. And so it doesn't really matter how long the source text is. If it's got too many facts, that's great because that's part of the challenge of Unit 4. So a lot more flexibility. We have, of course, source text provided in all our theme-based lessons, writing source packet, if you are with a school, you may have the classroom supplements that have all that. You'd like to make a reminder sign for the unit. It's handy to use highlighters when teaching the topic clincher rule, especially if you've got materials that are written, designed with a topic clincher relationship to demonstrate that rule. Jennifer has a good question. I am going to hit that one right now. She says, I have a reluctant writer. Can I let him choose the topic? Well, yes and no, Jennifer. What happens is if you give the kids too much freedom, they don't know what to do. They may pick something that's too obscure, so there isn't good information available. What I would do rather than letting him choose is I'd maybe try and give him some options so that you've got materials that you know are guaranteed to work. If your reluctant writer is a boy, which I think it is because of your pronoun there, one thing that always seems to be a hit with boys 
are animals that are particularly weird or ugly or dangerous or disgusting. Those tend to always be a hit. I had some source text on flowers from the Narnia-based writing lessons I was using with a group of kids. I just thought, oh, this peonies and, and daisies. My gosh, the boys are going to go die. So I went and got some carnivorous plant information, the pitcher plant, and that redeemed the day. So I let the girls pick whatever flowers they wanted to, and then I let the boys choose the Venus flytrap or the much more aggressively powerful pitcher plant. So yes, I would say let them choose, but not free whatever you want to do, because then they'll get overwhelmed and say, I can't think of what I want to do, I, I don't know. Just give them some choices, and be sure you've got materials that work. Good question there. All right, so when we hit Unit 4 here, we're going to be summarizing the reference. And in a way, this can be a little harder than the fiction writing of Unit 2 if you're using Aesop Fables or Unit 3 with the story sequence chart because you have to be obedient to the facts. You have to be a little more accurate in your note-taking. You can't just make up stuff. Making up facts is generally frowned upon, although it does seem to be popular among presidential candidates from time to time. But the idea is your teaching of the outline process is focused on choosing keywords that will help you accurately reconstruct the facts. We also want to teach the topic clincher rule, and I will have them memorize that rule. And we can think about these Unit 4 assignments as reports, but not a finished product. Some people get a little bit frustrated with Unit 4 only because they think, but, 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 what about an introduction and conclusion, and what, what about making this the whole thing? So instead, in Unit 4, just think process. This is just a piece of the whole that we're going to get to down line. And that's fine, because what we want is to understand a portion of the whole very, very well. And then when we get to a more finished product type of thing in Unit 8 with the formal essays, this is easy because we've done it several times. So think process, not product. And the thing we want to do is try to create assignments that are going to be very clear. So we will communicate a certain number of topics under one subject area, and then a specific number of facts to collect up for each of those topics. So basically, unit four assignment size is one or more paragraphs, and each paragraph would have a different topic, and those topics would be connected or divisions of a larger subject matter. And we'll get to that. We want to help the students start to find their own appropriate source text. And I think this diagram here is very helpful in terms of seeing what you're looking at. You start with a topic, and you have 10 or more facts. And from that, those 10 or 20 or 30 or whatever, you're going to choose, and the students are going to choose, what's interesting, important, or relevant, and come out with six or seven facts that they will actually put into the written summary. So that idea. The Probably the most important thing to consider is how to choose the facts. And the more you have to choose from, the more challenging or difficult it's going to be. You would assign, and I sometimes say when I'm teaching this, the number of facts per topic the number of details to include in a paragraph, you can just decide that yourself. And you could almost go by grade level. Up through grade three, three is probably fine. Upper elementary, four or five, middle school, six or seven. I probably don't like 
more than about seven, some people write 170 word paragraphs, but nobody really likes reading them. And it kind of depends on the style or aptitude of your student. If you've got a student who writes a lot of detail, they remember a lot, they want to tell everything about everything because everything is so interesting, then seven facts could be a really long, long paragraph. So you might cut that down to six or five. If you have a student who's very terse, you know, just here's the shortest way to say this fact, and here's your five and we're done, and you want a little more content, you might up that to six, seven, maybe even eight in a paragraph. It doesn't really matter. What matters is the teacher decides, and I usually decide with a range of one. So five or six, six or seven, three, you know, four or five. That way, if the student gets the five and that's all they need minimum and they're done, okay, that'll work. But sometimes you say, oh, this is really one more interesting, important thing. I really want to add this in. You can go and have one more. So I find that a range of one works very well. The other discussion, and, and we go into a lot more detail on this in the TWSS, but that is how to choose, to, to choose what's interesting versus what you know people think is important. If a student's old enough to understand the word relevant, we'll use that as well. But what's interesting or important? Now, some people feel that the students should always try to go for what's important. Some teachers believe that what's important is more important than what's interesting. I kind of lean the other way. I believe that what's interesting is generally going to be more interesting than what's important. So I will generally say, tell me what you think are the most important facts about this topic. And of course, if we look back in our life, it's generally the interesting things that we remember. And so there's more learning going on. The other danger is if you say, well, you should choose what's important. And the student doesn't really know what's important just because he or she has a lack of life experience and discernment and judgment to be able to make that call, you know, what's more important than something else, they could be wrong. Whereas if you say, you know, just choose what you think is interesting, that's a safer zone because you can't really be wrong. Well, hey, this was interesting to me. Okay, great. I always tease and say, you know, when I was growing up, I started my report writing career in, you know, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade. And basically in my day, some of you are as old or close to my age, so you probably remember when we had to use real books and encyclopedias to get information because the internet didn't exist. So our method of writing a report was go to the encyclopedia, look up your subject, Japan, whatever, read till you find a pretty good sentence, copy that sentence and change a few words if you can, read till you find another pretty good sentence, copy that one, change a couple words, read, copy, change, read, copy, change, read, copy, change until you got enough. And that was my method of writing reports. And it seemed to work pretty well because I, I always got A's as best I can remember. But I do remember having two distinct thoughts. One thought was, what I am doing here is probably illegal because the teacher kept saying, don't copy from the encyclopedia, put it in your own words. The problem, of course, is I didn't own any words. And I thought it not fair because the encyclopedia already got the good ones. So I felt justified in my crime. But the other kind of interesting memory I have is thinking to myself, this is really stupid. If anyone actually wanted to know about Japan, they should just read the darn encyclopedia. Why make me copy it? And now that I'm grown up, I kind of agree with myself. There didn't seem to be a clear purpose there. And so what I would say to students now is, please tell me what you think is most interesting about something. Then that tells the student that I, the coach, the teacher, the parent, whatever, 
I appreciate their opinion. I want to know their opinion. I value that. And it gives the task, I think, uh, a bit more of a purpose. At least in retrospect, I think it would have been if the teacher said, students, Andy, please tell me in your report the things you think are interesting about Japan. And I might have missed some of the important facts, but really, I mean, who cares? One of the things I have noticed, too, is that this word summarize. Summarize is an awful word. Nobody likes this word. I didn't like it growing up. I don't know ki any kids who like it. And it's unfortunately, I think, a bad word because if you know, if you try to get a sense of it, what does that mean, summarize? And you think sum, sum. Sum is the total of in math. You know, give me the sum, the whole of it. And then you walk into the whole experience of trying to summarize, thinking, OK, what I have to do is tell all that information in this little bit of space. You know, I have to tell all that in less space. Well, the fact is, you can never tell all that in less space. If you can tell all that, you need the same amount of space. What you're really doing is you're telling not all of it, but some of it, which is why correctly spelled, I believe this word would be written S-O-M-E hyphen A hyphen R-I-Z-E, or with a nod to our Canadian friends, R-I-Z-E. Some arise is what we're doing. We are taking some of it, but not all of it. And then the question becomes, you know, which sum to choose. We also introducing here in Unit 4 the clincher, the topic clincher rule. And this is kind of an extension of what we've done before. Hopefully in Unit 2, you introduced the title rule, that the title should repeat, preferably repeat. It actually sounds better when you use the exact same word two or maybe three words from the last sentence in the composition. So you're writing a little Aesop fable, and you get to the end, and you say, OK, what are my most dramatic words? Which words in this last sentence give the best image or feeling, carry a little oomph, and make the title out of those last sentence? Or you might think of a very good last sentence and then think of a very good title, you know, a title you really like, and then you can add a last sentence or, or work words from that title into the last sentence. So that's what we generally teach in Unit 2. Hopefully you've done that. And then in Unit 3, we continue that idea. Some people call this a story clincher. Uh, it's really the same thing. It's no different than Unit 2. You are using the last sentence of the story to create the title. And hopefully that last sentence gives it a feeling of completion, something like that. Unit 4, though, is where we will teach the topic clincher idea. And the diagram works kind of like this. You have the topic sentence, a certain number of details. You have then the clincher sentence. And the Canadians, when I first started doing this years and, you know, 25 years ago, gosh, has it been that long? We would kind of have the students repeat the keywords of the topic. So if the topic was pitcher plant largest carnivorous, right? then we would tell them to put those three keywords in the clincher spot as well. But over the years, I have found that it works better, at least for me, to be a little more flexible. And instead of putting the keywords in advance in the outline, just put the word clincher there to remind you of the rule, so that or remind the student of the rule. So when you get to the end of the paragraph, you start thinking, OK, in this last sentence, whatever I write, I have to repeat or reflect two to three key words from the topic. So I actually have the students memorize the rule, and we'll do a door test or test them somehow so that they, they say it consistently in the same way, the topic sentence, 
and the clincher sentence must repeat or reflect two to three keywords. And this is a very powerful rule in the seminar I, I go into how it can rescue a paragraph. You can get way off topic. You can be way over smog and pollution in Jakarta, Indonesia, and if you stop the paragraph, people wonder, well, what was that all about? But in the clincher, if you add in and say something about, you know, the pitcher plant, largest carnivorous plant, then suddenly the digression or the, the fact that didn't seem perfectly relevant or connected uh, kind of loses its distraction because you sound kind of like you know exactly what you're talking about. So that topic clincher rule, you want to have a poster. You can make one just like this or you can buy our posters. If you have a premium content off our website, you have many posters that can be printed available to you. And then, as I said, the details uh, are determined by the teacher. The assignment says how many details to look for. And it doesn't really matter how much is there. There could be 10 and you want 5. There could be 20 and you want 5. There could be 100 and you could still choose 5 details out of 100. And so that, that determines the target. So length dictates the structure. And then what we do is have the students highlight in their student writing the keywords which are repeated or reflected. The dolphin or elephant mini books that are provided with the TWSS course. Of course, if, if any of you have the student writing intensive, I do that on the video using the mini books and having them highlight those keywords to see exactly you know, how that can happen. Either repeat using the same word or reflect using synonyms. I've never done this, but I've talked to a couple teachers who have. One of them really swore by it, uh, particularly with kids who struggle, is that if they don't get this idea of kind of integrating keywords from the topic into the last sentence, then you can actually have them just rewrite the topic sentence and change one or two or more words by using a thesaurus. You would think that would sound redundant, but it really doesn't. It works. I, all I can say is, the first time I started teaching with this role, I, I remember reading the, the work of the students in the class. It was my two oldest daughters, who were 8 and 10 at the time, and a bunch of their friends. And so I had this little gaggle of 8, 9, 10-year-old girls. And I remember reading their writing, thinking to myself, wow, this sounds very organized and intelligent. In fact, it sounds even more organized and intelligent <laughs> than, than these children actually are. It's kind of a magic bullet. And I went up and talked to Dr. Webster. I said, how'd you come up with this rule? And he went into a, a little diatribe about how the college students, you know, university students he was teaching, really didn't understand that a paragraph has a topic and it stays on a topic and, and you indent and create a new paragraph when you are moving on to a new topic and he said you know this rule was helpful even for college students to help them understand that a paragraph is a unit of thought on something and a funny thing is when I follow this rule and I read what I wrote I tend to think that my writing sounds a little more organized and intelligent perhaps than I really am Kathleen has an interesting question I'll address right now. She says, is the thought behind the topic clincher rule the same reasoning behind pulling the title from the final sentence? I would say yes and no. Yes, in that there is a symmetry to the title and the last sentence. And when you hit that Though that thing that's in the title, when you hit those words at the end, it gives a great feeling of closure, of order. Think about this book, Where the Red Fern Grows. You have to read this whole book about this boy and these dogs and their adventures, and all the time you don't know where is this red fern. You're just wondering, why is this thing called Where the Red Fern Grows? And then the dogs die, and then he buries them, and finally, at the very end, 
you learn that that is where the red fern grows. And so you feel happy about mystery solved. That's one effect of repeating the title in a book. And in a book, of course, you don't have to do it at the very, very last sentence, but you know, toward the end works pretty well. Same thing, I've seen kids come up with very interesting and creative titles. So it is a way to get a better title, it gives symmetry, and it is kind of a foreshadowing of the topic lyncher idea. But probably the biggest difference between the title idea and the topic clincher idea is that in the title, it actually sounds better if you repeat, use exactly the same words. In the topic clincher, the paragraph clincher, you actually want to be not using too many of exactly the same words because it starts to sound a little redundant. And and often there's a word, you, you know, what do you say, pitcher plant, a pitcher plant's a pitcher plant, there's no synonyms. But carnivorous, you could perhaps substitute in meat eating, right? And instead of plant, you might have vegetation. So you can look for reflecting with synonyms in the topic clincher, that seems to work better. Whereas the title, repeating the exact words from the last sentence seems to be a little more stylish. So I think that, I hope that answered the question. Yes, well, you, if you can explain it to a third grader, good luck. At least he's curious about why you do everything you're doing. That's a good sign. But at some point, you just have to say, well, because I said so. <laughs> we do have to stop here because we're out of time for today. But because we don't want to leave you hanging too long, we'll go ahead and post the rest of the content later this week. Thanks so much for joining us. If you enjoyed this episode and want to hear more, you can subscribe to this podcast in iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. Or just visit us each week at IEW.com slash podcast. Until then, on behalf of Andrew Poudois and the team at IEW, I thank you for the privilege of allowing us to partner with you on this educational journey toward better listening, speaking, reading, writing, and thinking.